let's go ahead and get started. Hello everyone today. Hello everyone. Welcome to today's Water Cooler Chat where we talk about all things live beer, whether it's orchestrating, delegating, broadcasting, developing, or just being here to hang out. It's all cool. Uh, today we are going to be doing a year-end kind of special. Um, nothing particularly special about it other than next week's Water Cooler Chat will be the first time that we actually skip a week um, just because it lands on Boxing Day, and I don't know, is Boxing Day technically a holiday or not, but I figured Boxing Day, probably not going to be a day we're going to do a water cooler chat, unless you guys really wish to, um, I think we're going to skip that one, uh, and then, so yeah, then uh, this will be the year-end last water cooler of 2022, and this amazing bearish year, so either way, um, yeah, we're going to go through introductions and some topics, and uh, we'll get go ahead and get started. So I'll start with myself. I'm Titan, been running the Titan Node Orchestrator pool since April of 2022, and today my topic is about um, front-end developer tools for wire, like a wireframe. Um, I'm currently in this uh, encoding hackathon, and... I want to build a front-end wireframe. That's one of the prizes. So if anyone has any experience with like maybe a good tool or UI for Ruby wireframes, um, yeah, I'd like to talk about that a little bit. So that's my topic. Uh, we'll move on to Ben. Would you like to introduce yourself and a topic? Hey, guys. Ben, been running the Authority Null Node for a little over a year now. Uh, no, no topics today, just listening. Very cool. Thank you for joining us, Ben. Pon, would you like to introduce yourself and a topic? Good evening, everyone. I'm Pon. I've been running my own orchestrator since April this year. Uh, I'm just uh, probably the only question that I've got. What's happening with Flypeer workload? Probably we've all seen dramatic decreases in it in the last couple of weeks. Uh, did you say uh, Livepeer workflow? Workload. Uh, workload. Load. There you go. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Um, yeah. There's an interesting topic. I think we'll have to definitely jump into that. So thank you so for, uh, so, so much for joining us, Pon. As always, Flo, would you like no. to introduce yourself and a topic? Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm Flo from Moz Computing, uh, orchestrator since uh, three months. I don't have any topic for today. Just listening. Very cool. Thank you so much for joining us. Chase Media, would you like to introduce yourself and a topic? Hi, everyone. It's Rebecca here with Chase Media. I've been running the um, orchestrator since February of this year. And uh, I'm just really listening in just to hear the topics. Um, Pon, yeah, that would be an interesting one. I'd be interested to see what everyone else says. Uh, my workload has dropped dramatically as well, but maybe they're doing different testing or different things on life here. So, yes, that, that's it. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining us. Papa Bear, would you like to introduce yourself on the topic? Hi, I am Papa Bear, and I have been running the Solar Farm Orchestrator uh, since July of last year. And uh, I had the same topic as Pawn. Where's all the work? It's been real slow this last week. Where's all the work? Question mark. There you go. That's the topic. Um, yeah, it's a good topic. I think we'll have to dive into that a little bit. Thank you for joining us, Papa Bear, as always. Uh, Varys, would you like to introduce yourself and a topic? Hey, I'm Varys. I'm running the Varys and Numeris.if orchestrator since 2019, and I don't have a specific topic right now. Very cool. Thank you so much for joining us. Frank, would you like to introduce yourself and a topic? Yeah, hi. Uh, I'm Frank. I'm running the original version of since uh almost two years, and um, I know special topic, but I'm interested by the topic from Pan also. Very cool. Thank you so much for joining us, Frank. All right, well, I think there's some consensus, ooh, live peer consensus around a topic today. Um, yeah, one major topic. Where did the work go? So, um, Pan, what have you, since you're the first to bring up the topic, Tell us what you've been seeing and uh, what your thoughts are. 
Well, I'm not really sure. It feels like we are council workers at the moment. Seven people standing next to, and one of them is working. Uh, looking at all the graphs, actually, the workload dropped dramatically. Uh, so max sessions decreased. Uh, mean mean value of a session decreased. Well, average value of a session uh, across all my orchestrators has decreased. And if tickets received has a massive decrease as well since last week, I think. I can go through the graph and see exact date when we start dropping. So I'm just wondering, does anyone know what's happening there, or? Um, or just... just just to just to clarify, is this like tickets decreasing, or is are you looking at like the that's value everything. of ETH? No, that's everything, and tickets decreasing and sessions decreasing. It's honestly seems a bit low, even average sessions across all the work. Well, all, all my orchestrators has is down. Minutes transcoded a day is down by half, at least. It just seems strange that it just dropped on. I can't tell you exact which date. Looking at my graph now, I think the drop was on the, the sixth. Looking at the graph, so the sixth was uh, ticket value received 0.02 if and we. We became to not point not not eight if a day, so it just seems sharp drop in one day. Um, is Magic this... money printer stopped? Yeah. Is this is this within the last like week or two weeks, or is this like the last like day or two? It's the last two weeks, I think. Uh, well, I can I see on my graphs a decrease on the sixth of this month. So the seventh, there is a sharp decrease of it. This is something that we've noticed too. I mean, my my orchestrators have gone down. I mean, you know, session counts on everything are down. Like I even noticed ticket counts were like at a, a quarter to half of what they used to be um, even before the VOD testing and stuff. So it's definitely fallen off. I think the Live Peer Explorer also shows a big drop off of work. Yeah. It was something uh, when I was looking at it the other day, it was, let me see what it is. I mean, our weekly fees paid is down 36%, which is down from last week, which was, you know, down from the week before that. Um, estimated usage is down 22%. Um, yeah. I mean, just, it's been a pretty hard fall off and, we don't really have any insights as to where or why. Like what any anything changed? Anything anybody knows of? I mean, to state the obvious, like the bottom fell out of the crypto market. So Well I that but I mean we're looking at usage on a on streaming, right? Like is that a direct correlation to how much people are gonna use a service? video i think it might indicate the interest like like i think majority of our streamers are doing web3 stuff right like the work we're mm. getting so like the interest in web3 is probably at its at, at, a, at a low so i i'm not too certain that the service we provide is very decoupled from the price and bullishness of the and hype of the market like i think there is still a large correlation just due to the sheer volume of our of our service we're doing right like mm -hmm. i would agree with that so, i think there is also a, a second element uh, that reduces uh, the earning it's a uh, like peer has uh, changed something uh, about uh, stability of the stream, you know, uh, no a stream is not the uh, same uh, when you are not in real time for one or two segments, you, you keep uh, the jobs so, or uh, if you check uh, all the Grafana since uh, two weeks, uh, the stream is uh, really more stable. So uh, there, there is a decrease in uh, payout because uh, before when you, when the stream uh, changed from orchestrator, 
that uh, there was more tickets because you you have a ticket uh, immediately when you get the job. Actually, it's not uh, the case. So uh, there is this point, and also the the fact that uh, there is uh, less uh, jobs in a few weeks. Okay. Mm. So, so what you're saying is, this is is that is that referencing the the fix they did with switching of the orchestrators? Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. The, actually, uh, when you go uh, for few uh, uh, segment uh, over the real time, you keep the job because it's not a, a big case. In fact, so no, if you check the Grafana, etc., you will see uh, there is no spike, etc. You will see you keep job uh, more consequently uh, than before it's why you uh, for the same uh, amount of pixel you encoding uh, you will see uh, you will earn a lot uh, less in fact because the, the fact that the the stream uh, change uh, all the time from orchestrator uh, that was a big uh, up in the earning for all orchestrator and actually that this is not the case it's why there is a very big difference in the number of uh, stream and the earning uh, in comparison to the number of stream of, uh, in fact. I don't know if I am very clear, but uh, <laughs> it's an idea. So are you, you're saying we get paid more for the beginning of a stream because we get paid the tickets up front and then when they switch, they're paying again. So essentially by switching all the time, you're paying out more. Is that what you're saying? Exactly, exactly. Ah. When the stream uh, jumped from an orchestrator to another, there are, there was a lot of lot uh, really more uh, tickets and than for the same stream, in fact. And uh, oh. at, at, at the point exactly when they uh, uh, use the, the new uh, version for the uh, live peer, uh, live peer Inc. In fact, uh, we we also uh, the stream was uh, very uh, more uh, steps. Table and uh, that's all. Uh, you you have a lot of less tickets. In fact. So Titan, if I if I understand correctly, what I'm hearing is he's saying is there was a an issue in the software that was causing payouts to occur more frequently because they kept switching between yeah, orchestrators, and as a yeah. result, now as a result yeah, exactly. now they fixed it that's why the payouts dropped significantly because it's not it shouldn't have been paying out as much as we were getting paid so now yeah, it's paying exactly. out the way it, it's properly paying out which again i don't yeah. want to say that because that's that's the way i'm getting paid out now i don't like it yeah uh, yeah for the same amount of uh, stream you are paid uh, uh, less than before it's uh, clear for me on my Grafana and uh, on the Grafana other, you, you will see you have a, a very, uh, uh, there is a, a less uh, payout for the same uh, number of stream and the same uh, amount of pixels because it's more important the amount of pixels than the, the number of stream. And is this correlated exactly to the same date that Pond pointed yeah. out, December 6th? Wow. Wow. Was oh, that, that's upsetting. Was, was that the that day? That is very upsetting. Was that the day that they did the pull request to update the that that fix? I think that's what uh, that's what um, Frank was alluding to, and I, I was kind of confused when Doug was mentioning that on the on the call. Um, but I guess that's the that pull request is that. Do you know the exact date of that, Frank? That pull request. I think. Yeah, I, I can check uh, on my Grafana. Uh, I will uh, post uh, later because I can't actually. I'm sorry, but uh, later after the uh, the watercolor, I will uh, post uh, some uh, uh, screen uh, shot of my uh, Grafana, and you will see exactly uh, the mm. hour and the the day they they put the the new version, and uh, the stream are really uh, more stable. There was. Uh, you will see also uh, for uh, one day there was something wrong for one day only, and after that they they fixed that and uh, that was over. <laughs> but before wow. that was a a problem because uh, the the stream jump all all the time because uh, you lose uh, the stream because you are ju just just for one uh, segment uh, not in real time and that was not uh, uh, for for us it was a problem in fact. And wow. 
Nej, vet för det nog för kan confirm vet vad stream seems to be a bit more sticky. So the session just stays with an orchestrator. It makes sense, but if that's a workload that we're gonna be getting an amount that we're getting paid out is a bit upsetting. We all got used to big payouts and often payouts now, I think. Well, that VOD stuff, I guess, made it exacerbated the problem, right? Like if you look yeah. at what all those little streams coming in, it just made that switching payout so much more. So technically it sounded like a a payout bug in the software that was causing us to get used to these extra payouts. Wowza. Uh, comment. Uh, I think it's merged three weeks ago. No. Yeah, and then it would have taken them a bit longer to fix that. So, hmm, interesting. Okay, so is that the conclusion then that the reason for the drop in payout is literally a technical issue that was fixed? Yeah, but looking at the live base explorer, you can see the drop in transcoded minutes, minutes as well. Yeah, but yeah, yeah, yeah the the minutes would that be out. separate. Minutes, yeah, minutes right. is separate. The payouts, one thing, but the minutes drop off. That's that just makes it worse, I guess. But I thought that minutes were just an estimate based on the fees paid out in the tickets. I don't know how they do the right. estimate. I don't. I, oh, but if um, that's an estimate, but that I could would say correlate. This, then. Yeah, I mean, last week was the lowest number of minutes transcoded since we moved to L2 with the exception of one week in early April. So definitely a, a decrease in the amount of, I mean, I don't, again, I don't know how they're coming up with that estimate, but. Yeah, but, but the fees paid, yeah, I'm curious as to how they get the um, estimated usage in minutes. I thought it was just an amount based on the price per pixel way per pixel times the amount of tickets that went out. Like, I don't think it's an exact amount of actual transcoding minutes. Like it's just like, if you have X amount of tickets that correlates to X amount of streams, I don't know. Well, it would explain the, it would explain the, I mean, the almost exact correlation of drop off and percentage wise, same difference, right? If it is estimated, because if it's all based on ticket payout amount, then you would see the same exact proportion every time. So that, that makes sense. And again, the fact of the matter is there's no like minutes, minutes transcoded recorded on chain anyway, right? So it has to be derived. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, like, because if a if a random broadcaster comes in, you you have no idea how many minutes they're transcoding. They'll never share that data. So the only thing you can do is see how much they're paying out in fees and how much they're willing to accept as a price per pixel, and extrapolate based on a four segment rendition that that would be roughly this amount exactly. of, right? Like it's, it's a total, um, yeah, like, yes. Yeah. It, it's, it's a bit of a guess. Um, so yeah. Uh, but either way, um, I find it very interesting that that is, so is that the consensus? Would there be any other reason for the drop off? I mean, my, my theory was just like, Hey, bear markets in like, People are just yeah, but they got some pretty compelling ninja facts that that support what they're saying, right? I I kind of felt the same way. I was like, oh well, you know, sentiments down, like you know, Web three down, like builders are you know taking break. It's Christmas, like you know, things are just down right now. That's what I was thinking. I wasn't actually digging up the facts and correlating it. And it sounds like Frank and Pond have done some some uh, forensics gathering. <laughs> Sherlock Frank is out there finding the clues, man. Um, it's just interesting, guys, because VOD has disappeared as well, so that made a sharp decrease straight away. And if we fix that ticket ticket issues, so that's making another decrease for all of us. Just because we're all sitting in the same channels, probably are talking privately and moaning that you haven't got a ticket for the last two days, three days now. Uh, <laughs> on the four, on the, who's doing on that? The four You're days. whining. 
You're not whining, uh, are you, Pond? <laughs> I'm always whining. That's the best thing I do. <laughs> yeah, it's it's funny. Now we're like, it, 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 our problems have shifted so much from like a year ago for the people that remember being on layer one. Like all we talked about was layer one fees, getting tickets once every two months right it's now like those problems are just so gone with arbitrum it's like we're moving on to different problems i actually I quite enjoy this conversation more because i'm like hey we're talking about my first world problems are relevant too <laughs> um okay very cool well um any other traffic comments on on the amount of work coming in or or how this is all working out like surely we've there's a there's a algorithm change so we're probably getting less tickets because they actually fixed an issue but what about overall traffic like are we just assuming the traffic is the same or is sediment down and and streamers are down and and these kinds of things you might want to ask uh eric or swiggy steven on those topics right like they probably could tell us better Yeah, I mean, I mean, I seem to be receiving a lot less work than you know um, over the last two weeks or so. Um, I agree. But, um, Me too. I mean, just a lot less. Have you like, tracked your stream count? Have you tracked but, your average enough to know if it's actually significantly down over the last like say month or two? Because like I, I I rarely know what my average is anymore. But have you like noticed it, it drop off? Without, like, significant yeah, I mean, there there's things. a lot of times where I just look down. I mean, I, I don't have, like, the actual numbers, but I just look down and I have, like, I mean, zero or one streams where, I mean, it, um, it's pretty unusual um, to see that, um, especially in the morning times for my, in my time zone. Um, it, I mean, it, it, it's not uncommon for me lately to have, like like I said, zero or one thing. streams happening. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, well, my Grafana is showing transcoded minutes a day, so it used to be about 12,000, 11,000 minutes a day, and I'm sitting at 4,500 at the moment. Well, less than 4,500, so that's a massive, massive decrease. Yeah. Free time. Yeah, I'm getting about half the tickets I would usually get in a day. Yeah, I'm getting less than half that I, what, what I would normally get. I mean, what I was getting... Less than half what I was getting before the VOD stuff. Like when VOD came in, then things were going crazy. I mean, I was told, I don't, I'm going to leave that out of it because I mean, uh, from that, I'm like down, like I'm getting like a, an eighth of the amount of work or seventh of the amount of work that I was during. The yeah. Day. But um, that was a, that was just a little uh, bonus, I guess. So, but uh, uh, yeah, there, there is two back. things. There is a, uh, sorry, there is less traffic also for sure. So it's, it's a fact. And uh, I don't know why, but uh, I saw uh, two or three days ago uh, a peak for uh, one hour, something like that, when a virus uh, goes to uh, 100 uh, stream, uh, uh, and uh, that's just uh, for one hour, and after that stop. I don't know why. I don't know if uh, Life Peer Inc. have the possibility to turn on and off something to send more stream to the Life Peer uh, network and keep one part to their own uh, transcoder and uh, they can adjust that if, uh, if they want. I don't know. I'm not sure about that. Yeah, in that, on that, I think we work in parallel just in case. So we're working as a backup as far as I know. I mean, my, my, my thoughts are, I, I just want to make sure, you know, this is a lull. This isn't like you know, someone abandoning the protocol or, or the live peer throwing the talent. I know we talked about, you know, they had a war chest that they're ready to survive the bear market, but how long, right? You know, these things could be signs. I don't think it is a sign right now that there's a problem, but just be a little reassuring to hear, you know, no, nah, we're good. You know, we fixed some defects. It's technical, you know, no big deal, right? Like that, that I guess would be, would go a long way. Well, if we see a uh, live peers stake on bonding, I think we know, right? <laughs> I'll start a run on the token. <laughs> we got some people that joined us just after introductions. We'll, we'll st let's uh, finish off some intros here. Ryan, would you like to introduce yourself on a topic?
Ryan, are you with us? I swear you were just like just talking. I don't know if you're mean. It's like got up from your computer. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Mike Z, would you like to introduce yourself in a topic? Hey, Mike Zuper. Um running Zodap for since February this year. Um I had a topic, it slipped my mind because of this crazy stream conversation we were talking about, but if it comes back to me, I'll uh, I'll bring it up. Very cool. Thank you so much for joining us. Ryan, are you here? No? I think he's at work right now, so he may have like had someone, you know, something that he's taking. Right, he's got to right I'm just quickly, guessing, but... Yeah. Quickly take off his headset and get back to his regular job. Stop yes, messing. like he's working. Yeah. Stop messing uh, around. Uh, yeah. Uh, I, my, my guess on that is, is about as good as my guess on what's going on with the streams, but yeah. <laughs> Stop messing around with people on the internet trying to make internet money. Jeez. Get your priorities straight, Ryan. Get back here. I know what my topic is, Titan. Yeah, you go for it. So I wanted to just talk about the reliability and performance board just to understand where it is, but I didn't know if anyone had a, you know, looked at there was a hackathon coming up or is actually probably started already for that streamer, streamr.network. And the thing about it that they were trying to implement was some of the things we talked about on gathering performance metrics from live peer nodes and, and having that data accessible for like a marketplace. So anyway, that was my topic. If we have time to jump into that, just figured I'd uh, throw that out there. Oh, that, that's a good topic. I, um, yeah, because the reliability and performance board, I we got the grant for. We did phase one, and then um, I was the one leading that charge, and uh, I totally fell off the planet and just stopped working on it. And then Ryan or Nelson, who's the who is a part of the uh, Live Here Grants program, he left and replaced it with someone else. So, but yeah, the problem was the contact. I I had a clear idea of how I wanted this to work until I talked to a few people, and I was like, technically, I don't know how to do this, and I don't know where we should start, and. I really should maybe put together a meeting and I, I guess there's, do we, do we still want this? Is this something that we still want and how complicated should it be? And, and, and these kinds of things. So um, I should probably put together a working group and restart the thread and, and uh, maybe continue down that path. Maybe a kick in the butt will help because we can actually, there's money set aside for us to complete this project. So probably worth doing. Yeah. Again, it's one of those small, like I look in small little pieces, right? I think that, you know, being able to collect metrics from a node and perhaps even publishing it on chain, that would be, that would go a long way to a marketplace. And I feel like that's probably a missing component for live peer in this, in this space is that, you know, it's got to be obvious, like what the metrics are that a broadcaster can use to determine whether he's going to get an affordable stream or he's going to get, you know, some janky choppy stream qualities high, like, you know, like it, being able to change those metrics. If I pay more, I should get better quality. Right? If I, you know, what kind of reliability guarantees are we going to have from the network? You know, all that kind of stuff. And I think metrics collection, part, you know, these are the things that could really accelerate a lot of projects, not just live here. Hmm. Yeah, that's that's a good point. I think I've been trying to figure out like maybe it's worth just creating like a, a desktop app where you just like stream into it and it shows you the end stream maybe in all the renditions or like a little player and then just gives you all the metrics that like you'd want. It just real like live and you can just test it for yourself. I, I don't know. Um, this is a conversation here we should definitely have. And like, yeah, I agree. Build the studio. Be able to view, like, all right. Was that? Yeah, probably. Uh, it might be a feature right that could go right in the studio or or the broadcaster. I mean, it, 
there's a variety of places where I think it makes a lot of sense. Yeah, I I mean, as much as like, yeah, round trip and all these things matter to us, um, during the hackathon that I went to ETH Global in San Francisco, I, there was, I was working with a guy who, um, who was uh, with Amazon Prime. So he had, he'd done a lot of video, uh, like Amazon video stuff. And so he built software that like 15 million people use at Amazon and like, uh, he's got some patents personally for Amazon for video tech, and like, I was like, yeah, okay, let's do live video. Let's, you know, we built our project on Live Peer, and like one of the first questions he had, he's like, what does Live Peer do? And like, it took us a, it took me a while to explain to him what it does, and even then, he's like, no, but I, I like, I still don't get what Live Peer does. Like, it, it took him a while to understand what live peer did and like as much as it's easy for us to understand because we're orchestrators and well, of course the trans code blah 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 but like it just took him a while like and he knows everything about the video stack he's very very technical but it just like took him a while to understand how it would fit into his stack and i thought that was an interesting um point of um friction for onboarding orchestrators it was like the understanding of like where it sits in the stack and like just like he's like does this do like is this a content delivery network it's like no it's like okay well then look what is it right like is so um yeah just like context around that was really interesting i mean if he if he's deep into the video world where what is the complication there in terms of understanding what life here is um it's just just an infrastructure layer right i mean that, all it does is compute is it that we're not offering enough and he just finds it to be limited or like i mean it's just one piece that can be integrated into I, whatever you want i think if you gotta remember though if you're talking about a web 2 guy right he's from, at amazon they're looking at centralized solutions that are you know building they're not just like bricks they are providing the whole thing right they're providing uh all batteries included solutions so like when he looks at the stack and he sees oh you got a gpu that can transcode a video but like what else like is that it like i need more than that to run a business you know what i mean i need more than that for my video uh you know stack to be successful so he's probably looking at it like that can't be it because you can't survive with just that yeah, I, I think he hit it on the head. Like, he, you know, he, he's coming from the full stack. Like, Amazon provides, you know, with one service, they provide everything from the streamer to the end user, right? And so he comes in and it's like, okay, so it's a CDN. No, it doesn't offer that. Okay, so, okay, so it, it's a, you know, it's a, it's a, it, it stores the files? No, no, there's no file storage. Well, then how do we, store any files it's like oh that's a whole nother protocol it's like oh okay wait so what does live beer do it's, oh transcodes okay and then so he was streaming we were so and you have to realize like we also built this app in 24 hours with no sleep so like a bit of context around it. it took us like half the day to even figure out what to build let alone like actually use the tech but uh that aside yeah he was just kind of like okay like i i i it, it it just took i was surprised i i thought he would have picked it up quicker he's a smart guy i've convinced him to start an orchestrator node so he's he's spinning on up right now and hopefully he'll come to these water coolers he's, he's a he's a cool guy um but yeah it, it was an interesting context for me that i was like oh it's not obvious what we do so that's probably why we front. don't have many independent broadcasters yeah, on the surface, Titan, I would agree because I I had a conversation similar to that with Speedy Bird, who's now part of the you know the the Work One Hundred, and like he was like, what do they do? Like you know, we worked together in the past, like you know, we know each other. He's very technical as well, but now he's running an Orc. It makes sense. But initially, when I started explaining it to him, and also not just the node running a node, like the tokenomics and the you know. All of the different pieces around live peer is definitely 
uh, you know, not like your Web 2 protocols. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, there's this extra degree of complex that we put on top of it that, like, it just doesn't exist in the Web 2 world. So that itself is extra difficult. You know, if you, you want to teach someone about the video stack all of a sudden you're like okay but there's also this crypto element and like this like centralized selection algorithm stuff and it's like what what like seems so unnecessary um but yeah uh i don't know where i was going with this but well you kind of went off tangent when we talked about the performance reliability stuff tied to streamer network for my topic right. so if there's if there's any other questions about that it's fine but if we wanted to finish your introductions or dive into some more details we can yeah I, I guess i'll finish off my point with that was like about the reliability and performance board was i think i'm just missing context around what we're trying to achieve like is this an internal tool for orchestrators or is this a tool for broadcasters because i think they would look differently if um depending on how we build or like what our goal is well, I think you, can, you could have a two branches for it. Use the same database uh, because the broadcaster is going to want to see different things than we want to see. Well, not really. We're going to want to see more or less same things. So we just can fine tune it our orchestrators to it. Right. Hmm. Yeah, so you have like a baseline amount of data and then however you want to display it, you just alter it that way yeah that's a possibility well still if a broadcaster gonna come in this is gonna want to see your latency gonna be, want to see how long you've been up without restarting your node and all sorts and more or less we all want to see that as well how latency uh is it get, getting better or got worse for some kind of reason and start looking the reason why it got worse and it can help both parties yeah, but and but that would be an orchestrator tool. I don't think that would be used for deli uh, for a broadcaster per se. Because yeah, so again, I think Doug Doug kind of enumerated some of that stuff when he um, was talking about it. Where a broadcaster is going to have X amount of metrics that, that that is of their concern, right? Like he was mentioning that there might be a trade off with quality and cost. Like if you think about running your own like media server out on a VPS somewhere, like one of the things that they commonly refer to is that, oh, if you want higher quality output from your, uh, you know, transcoding, that it's going to take more system resources. So it's a dial that the, the, the person who's setting that up or who's going to be, you know, pushing their broadcasting, their content is going to look and say, oh, I, I don't want to spend a lot of money on transcoding or server hosting so like i want to be able to control that dial so if i if i turn the dial down on on um on cost then i know that quality is going to take a hit right but if i'm concerned that i uh, quality is a is a primary concern of mine then i don't concern myself with cost then i want to be able to say i want the highest quality renditions coming out of this right like there's going to be a you know, those are just two metrics, but there could be 30 metrics that, you know, people are going to pick and choose their their reasons why they want to go with one orc or another. Right. And I think being able to look at it and say uptime, availability, quality, cost, like, you know, you name them. Those factors have to be part of that selection information when a, when a broadcaster is like, yeah, this orc makes sense. It's going to give me the right cost, quality, et cetera you know that I, that I'm going to be able to manage my my uh my my streams that way. At least that's my thought. Yeah. Yeah, I'd agree with that. I think I think what happened too was when I went to the ETH Global event and I saw people trying to build on Live Peer. Um I kind of like originally when I put up the reliability and and performance dashboard, I was like, "Oh, you you're going to individually select your orchestrators that you want to deal with." Um, and Frank had mentioned that, like, hey, no, we should probably be focusing just on this, like, general algorithm that, that you put in your inputs and let the algorithm choose, and it'll spit back what you prefer, like, you know, price and quality, but, you, you know, you're not going to go and 
individually inspect the orchestrator, right? And after doing the ETH Global, I'd, I'd probably lean more towards Frank's approach. Like, you don't want to have to go in and select individual orchestrators. Like, you're probably just going to want to say, hey, here's my price. Here's my quality. If you, you know, let the like let like let the network figure that out, and I just want the end use of what I'm asking for. And um, so I don't know. I I just been thinking about that a little bit too. Well, just to dovetail back, go ahead, Papa. Go ahead. I was gonna say I would agree with that. That it would make more sense to uh, have it at a network level. Um, then you get the extra redundancy and stuff built in and the less complexity of trying to figure out who am I going to use. If you can just basically put all your parameters in and let the network select based on those, that just seems like a much easier solution for a broadcaster to understand and use. Yeah, which which goes against my thesis in my um, in my grant proposal, which talks about how Orchestra broadcasters are going to want to select specific orchestrators. And Frank had brought up this. I mean, Frank, I'm speaking on your behalf, of course, so you can step in if I've got something wrong. But like, it was basically like, yeah, like let the select let the let the selection algorithm do the work. All of us are just posting up what we can provide, and and let the let the let the machine do the work, and 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 it can be an open and public kind of place. Well, I, with one small little caveat, right? Like I think for some of the general quality and op metrics and things like that, that's fine. But like one of the things where we they talked about in some of these uh, discussions about data is like content detection, like copyright and information, like securing the stream and, you know, like these are kinds of things that are not currently part of the protocol, right? Like but they're metrics that matter to broadcasters. Like these are things that they want to be able to make sure that these kinds of things are happening, even though it's distributed. And I feel like if broadcasters, or rather if orchestrators are publishing metrics about, you know, what kinds of capabilities that they have, and that could also include, you know, maybe some someone forked it and put some AI detection in there, or maybe they've taken what LivePeer has already implemented and went beyond it and added their own secret sauce. Like it's, it's a place where those kinds of metrics being published on chain, then anyone can consume them and make choices about what work to use. Like the selection process from LivePeer Inc is probably a good place to, to look at that, right? Like, hey, today it's a latency. If your latency score is under one second, you're in, right? Maybe, you know, if you have, support for higher end graphics cards that kind of capability could be baked into their selection algorithm based on orcs publishing on chain data using a, something like streamer r network where <clears throat> that's the whole thing about their their protocol is you know being able to publish data and then subscribe to it and being able to look at that on chain with that complete transparency and i feel like that reliability metrics coming from an org and the capabilities from an org are very easily integrated into that streamer network. And then the broadcaster on the live peer side could simply subscribe to that network and read that metrics and get all the performance data it needs to choose how to, you know, send the next stream in the selection algorithm. Streamer. So I just went to the streamer.network website because you kind of mentioned it. Decentralized real-time data network. Create, share, consume data streams with an open, scalable Web3 protocol. Huh. Okay. There was a, you know, some sort of like ETH hackathon or some ETH global. I forget exactly where I, I found them, but it was funny that I saw LivePeer and Streamer R in this call together talking about the possibilities to integrate their protocols. So it was one of those things where it was just like, oh, wow, I was looking at Streamer. And then all of a sudden, LivePeer and Streamer had a some sort of conference. They were together talking about how what possible integrations were. And the one that Streamer founder was like, it would be great to have performance metrics. If somebody wants to come to our next hackathon and, and do a performance metrics 
integration with streamer and live peer we're we'll fund that i was like oh wow like this is like you know you got your grant on the live peer side you could get the hackathon on the streamer side and and solve a real problem oh interesting yeah I have to look look more into this i'll uh, see if i can yeah i can see if i can find the video that had live peer and stream are together but yeah it was just uh it was kind of just kind of cool figured i'd bring it up to this group yeah definitely huh that's fascinating yeah any anything we can do to increase the obviously the reliability and performance of our nodes and then on top of that be able to broadcast that so that people can view that for the people that do care but it doesn't seem like the broadcasters i don't know just from the hackathon i saw 12 projects built on top of live here like uh give, given again it was 24 hours but like none of them cared about any of the back end stuff they just wanted to send a stream and get the end product that was it like they were like i don't care how fast you did it as long as it looks good as long as it looks great and it's reliable and and that's like you know that was like the the amount of energy they put into live peer and the rest of it was like okay how are we gonna have you know where where's the customer gonna click where, what are we gonna have a chat box or a subscription you know they're working on front end application stuff right but when it came to the live peer integration they were like sweet there's a plug and play js uh template that we can pull right off of live peer docs slap that onto the onto the the front end oh we're done you know yeah but i i felt like that's the difference between the messaging i see from live peer is like they want these solo content creators these these eager developers that like provide like these small micro kind of solutions for hobbyists and it, it seems like enthusiasts and stuff like that but like when you look at a guy like um you know uh, I forget his name from the Sweden, you know, Swedish public broadcast in Jarvis, Jarvis was yeah. his name. Yeah. Um, you know, he had a whole suite of things that were more along the lines of what I was talking about with streamer integration. For example, as an enterprise, he wants the ability to say my CDN, my storage and my transcoding fees all of this stuff is going to be under one umbrella as a quote platform and that when he as a content producer will want to broadcast through it he'll provide the 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 payments for those services but it'll get he'll get the transcoding the ingest the cdn it, it, it'll all be decentralized but there'll be like some streamer r um you know data channel where he can just go in and and read that on-chain data to make sure that you know one the cdn's up and running and the costs are affordable and you know the transcoding's running and you know being able to collect all of that stuff out of but to your point is a little enthusiast guy he doesn't care about the back end he's got a live peers his end end point and he's happy right he's coding but you know enterprise adoption or or larger scale deployments are going to really need to understand more around some of the quality metrics the security metrics you know some of the availability metrics and i and i think that's kind of how that that conversation about the reliability board was born out of those topics with jarvis right yeah i mean the people who can actually afford to pay for continual use of the platform are the people who are going to care about that stuff are you saying it's not going to be the person who didn't sleep for 24 hours and tried to win a thousand bucks? <laughs> no, you know, no, you because might be part of it, but go ahead. Ben. Because after you spend the 24 hours on it, that's it. It's, I mean, it, it's gone. There's no customers. There's no continual use of the, the platform, the network. You may you know, be I'm right. I'm not saying hackathon people, you know, don't put a shit ton of work in it and some really good products are born out, born out of there, but you know most that's of the, early most on in the feedback loop right we're talking about companies that are already established that are providing the work whereas an enthusiast is looking for the next big thing right he's right. trying to he's trying to build that next platform or you know the, like you said the twitch clone or the this that clone that someone's going to come buy up and that's great you know yeah. innovate so they're going to be hack. looking yeah they're going to be looking at these metrics going okay i want to understand this I want to I want to I want to figure out that this is to our standard and high quality 
not just hey let's whip something together in in 24 hours and watch it burn well most companies if you're going to do business right no one's just going to hand you money and say okay i trust you right like again they need they need you know facts to to support the assertions you're making right you're going to sell somebody something you got to provide the claim right what is it that i'm actually going to provide you and at what cost and if it's ingesting video storing it for playback a- across thousands of people we look at like an akamai or you know a cloudflare or some of these other services that provide it today they have really clear value props right like you're going to pay x and here's what you're going to get and i think for live peer that component doesn't exist right like if you look amazon can tell you yeah we can guesstimate but like you know their amazon akamai all these different service providers have pretty clear pricing and they can give you specific numbers and i think for the distributed nature we don't have that centralized pricing model we'll have a node operator running at whatever prices he wants and whatever quality metrics he can afford and you know and then there're going to be some bigger operators that have better quality and better stuff but it's where this metrics this collection to a centralized or i rather a decentralized but publicly available uh, ledger will allow that kind of stuff to naturally happen and i think that's a big gap today in what what's what's out there and i think streamr and some of these other networks are going to be these are connective tissues that are going to make this platform viable man that's inspiring you should you should write down you you, you should you should formulate a plan on what this performance and reliability dashboard would look like I have been for the last, you know, six or eight months. Like it's even big, bigger than uh, um, the, uh, again, this goes to kind of talking about videominer.com, right? Like, you know, this is stuff I've shared with, with several other orgs just talking in general about like, how does media network as a DCDN fit into the network? How does, you know, stream R, how does, you know, lens protocol, you've mentioned that on a few times, like each of these things have a component in the grand stack when you look at a platform and right now they're just desperate pieces that aren't related but someone's going to bring that connective tissue and 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 bring these things together as a product as a solution and it begins it's less web 2 web 3 more than it is here's how you solve the problem and here's the cost and the profile for the, the value prop and web 3 won't be or web 2 won't be able to compete because everything's centralized and controlled Whereas these these other paradigms are open and transparent and and by nature cost effective, so we'll see, man. I, I'm working on it. We got plans to take over the whole crypto world, but one one protocol at a time. Yeah, definitely. Uh, let's do some more introductions. We got some people joining us. Uh, John, would you like to introduce yourself and a topic you might have? Hey, this is John with the League Encoder. Um, uh, thinking of topic. So uh, you know, I've been working with Ivan on the NetEnt stuff a little bit. Uh, if anyone has questions there and kind of what the roadmap thought is on that, uh, can answer those and talk about the progress there. Uh, really interested in the conversation on the reliability performance dashboard as well. Um, you know, I'll just throw some comments in there too because I, I I think one of the it's it's a nice upgrade from the regular hourly tests that we get. You know, so I think that's one of the value adds for it. Um, uh, nothing else really on uh, no, no other topics. Very cool. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, how do you say this name? Uh, Nujar? Uh, would you like to introduce yourself and a topic you might have or a question? Yeah, hi. Good, good, uh, good evening. It's, uh, yeah, Nujar, I guess, is the, is the way you say it. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm now working on a grant for, for uh, trying to use the uh, Mike mentioned before trying to use the, the MPEG-7 signature uh, in order to be able to, to detect duplicates and, and to use that for, for, well, for, it has many, many use cases actually. The, the first one would be the, um, the detection of, of uh, duplicates of, uh, of forgeries and, and this kind of stuff. Um, so yeah. This is what this is what I'm, I'm about now. Welcome to the community, man. We we definitely need some of that kind of stuff in here. So thank you. Yes, 
Absolutely. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, you said you're a grant uh, winner, so you, you've won a grant for this project? Uh, yes, yes, I'm currently developing it. Like uh, past month, I developed, uh, I, I, I delivered the first milestone. Uh, the, the way we are develop, we are, we are delivering it through, through the forum. So I'm basically making like little articles, little pills. Will be four milestones, so it will be four pills that I am I am complementing with a with a GitHub repository. So for now, we I'm basically just just uh, took a not too big uh, database, which is uh, kind of uh, from the from the literature. And I'm just extracting signatures and and putting them together and, and mixing them and measuring distances and this kind of stuff. So cool. I, yeah, I would be very happy if, if to to have more more eyes on it because uh, well, as you can imagine, it's it's quite complex and I'm just just myself it's uh it's, it's not so easy. But we have a, a couple of folks that are into AI and and you know scene detection this kind of stuff. So like if you could share your grant that you submitted in the chat here for this uh, water cooler, I'm sure there's mm -hmm. quite a few folks that would definitely. Uh, be interested in looking at what you got and and how they could help. What 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 is this chat? I cannot see here. Uh, in the chat, if you go into um, hang on here, let me pull it up. I have a lot of. Uh, yeah, there's a lot of rooms in here, I but if you from Discord. <laughs> yeah. Uh, actually, how do you get to the is chat? It, I'm looking at the it. The water now. cooler side chat. Is that what you're looking for? Yeah, two channels about this. Yeah, well, my, my my plan was to drop it in the in the grants. Okay, so, yeah, yeah that's it, cool. Yeah. If you mm -hmm. can do it there, if you drop it there, just tag me on it, and I'll uh, I'll circulate it to some of the other channels as well, so folks can get a, a chance to look at it. But I think this is a topic that is of high interest for a lot of people. I I I, I this, this initial part with it, which is just pure researching, where I am just. Putting together metrics and, and finding uh, different uh, ways of doing this is is kind of okay. It's kind of solo, but but I think I will for sure need help when when it comes to milestone four, which is about integrating it in life peer, integrating it sure. in the protocol. So yeah, I guess I don't know if somebody has a, a, a data set that has duplicates and then wants to verify if if there are duplicate segments within it. It would be that would be a very very nice way to put it together. But, cool. Well, yeah. keep on your research, man. We'll keep an eye on the grant and see how you're progressing. At any point you get ready, just let us know, and we'll see who we can muster together to help. Okay. Awesome. Thank you. Very cool. Thank you for joining us, uh, Nijar. Um, great to see you. And I see you are actually an OG of Live Peer. You joined May 29th of 2019 the uh, live peer discord channel which is uh much much earlier than most of us i think varies is the only one earlier than you so uh, yeah it was was um it was contributing also to the to the verifier the we were we were doing oh that wow in, in epic this epic uh, verifier that is there i don't know does anybody use it <laughs> uh so yeah it is a, this is a very cool project that peer has has captivated me for, for a long time very cool. Well, well, no one knows that verifier because I don't think many know how it actually works and what its use case is. So I, I would love to understand more about it. I heard a lot about it for some period of time and then I don't hear much about it at all anymore. So if there's anything you know about that you want to share, dude, I, I think that's those are topics that have just kind of got lost in the by the shuffle. But it, it's basically the, the purpose of the verifier was to make sure that the transcoders, they, they, they actually do their job. You don't That's want, right. You don't want the transcoder to, to, to send you crap renditions. So black renditions, he will charge you for, for a rendition, which is all blacks, which has zero computational cost, but you are still paying for it. So that was the purpose of the, of the whole technology we put there. The thing is now, now with what I'm researching now with all this MPEG-7 signature, I'm, I'm actually realizing that maybe that may be obsolete already. <laughs>
So. Oh, wow. Okay, cool. That's yeah, oh, good stuff, there. man. Very cool. Awesome. Well, it's great to see you um, join our water cooler chats. We uh, we do this every week, so if you uh, want to pop in and say hello, feel free every week to come by. Absolutely, absolutely. I'm I, I'm trying to to understand better all the all the insights and all these things that you are here guys speaking is uh, super interesting. I'm slowly getting getting to understand more and more. At the beginning, it's very intimidating because you just go through the through the forums reading things that you don't get. But uh, but slowly I'm starting to to grab more, more ideas. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. And the best way to learn is just to come and challenge yourself and listen and join in on the, on the conversation, and uh, and you'll pick it up over time. So great to have you, and thanks for joining us. Uh, Andrew, would you like to introduce yourself on a topic? Yeah, my name is Andrew, and um, I guess uh, when I came in the middle of the conversation, Mike was talking about how what is being built now is for the future, not for what you're going to make a week from now or a month from now. It's it's years from now. And we're truly seeing that with Musk buying Twitter and, you know, not being able to say a certain thing. That's ridiculous. So this technology that we're building, that we're supporting, although it may not make any money right now, it will later. I mean, fungible money you can actually use, but you have to look at the future. So um, I, I have a ISP. We built a data center. We've got lots of power, lots of bandwidth. And uh, one of our goals is we have a big node and we want to contribute. Um, we're working on a median net, I think. It's a lot of work. So I don't even know where to start half the time, but that's that's my next goal. I'm still waiting to have level three light up our 10 gig service. It's like, come on, guys. But I guess when you live in the middle of nowhere, and you have them bring in 100 gigs of raw optics to build an ISP, it takes a bit of time to get things going. I was hoping to start this week, but nope, more research. So that, that, that's about it. I'm, I'm hoping to build a website uh, called Epic Streams where you can basically broadcast what you want. And if the community deems your content as you know, inappropriate or if you're making, breaking federal laws, then yeah. You know. In other words, you got to have an issue with it for someone to have to go through the process to take it down sort of deal. like. Um, in, in the United States, we have a the, the due process where if you are truly violating copyright laws by taking a movie and broadcasting it and collecting money, then they have to go through a legal process, and that's it, right? So until that legal process, you know, comes into play, then you should be able to stream what you want, and that's why I'm a big supporter of of what you guys are doing and then lots of other platforms out there. Very you know, cool. Take it back to the you know the early days of the internet where it it was there wasn't a Big Brother and saying what you can you can go to what you can't um you know it's like no you can't look up Pokemon cards or or something qu crazy like that you never know right so. yeah yes yeah, sir yep right, I've always wanted Elon Musk to be my brother I just didn't know he'd be my big brother. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to be related to that dude ever. No, nah, I wouldn't want to be related to any of those people out there. It's like, no. Nah. <laughs> <laughs> I'll pass on that one. Let's keep it <laughs> like it should be. Like the onion router. It's like, yeah, hey, thanks, thank you to the United States for you know the government for creating Tor. That was like that was what we're we're building now, you know, twenty years ago. Yeah. But except for it's not so encrypted or decentralized now, is it? <laughs> Very cool. Thanks, Andrew, for joining us again. Great to see you, and yep. uh, welcome back. Uh, Vivek, would you like to introduce yourself and a topic? Yeah, hello. Am I might be doing? Yes, I can hear you. Yeah, so, like, basically, I'm also new to this uh, life year stuff, and, like, recently I went to a hackathon, and, like, I just built a project over there. Like the thing was like we were using your like API for get like uploading the video and like streaming the video for the same. And after that, like uh, we get a playback ID as a response. Like we used all that thing and like um, we created an app like uh, for staking just for the streamers where users can come and like just directly stake on video. And like the video with the highest number of donors can like just get the money back and the one like who lost it will just lose it. Oh, interesting. Is this an app you built in the hackathon? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, if you want to see, like, I have a YouTube link for that also. Yeah, uh, go ahead and post it in the water cooler side chat. It's just two channels above this. Um, yeah, post post the video there. We'd love to watch it. Yeah, fine. Like, that's all of me. Very cool. And which hackathon were you a part of? 
actually it was like a offline uh, hackathon for college and like uh, polygon where like polygon was the sponsor so like i thought it was on blockchain and like i find you guys like it was much more supportive like just upload the video and like for streaming you have a player component we use it for the like uh, streaming part and like you give back a uh, playback id for uploading the same oh very cool so it wasn't even a blockchain related hackathon it was it was something local to yeah. Yeah, like just, but still, I have an idea about that, and I like I find your platform supportive. Like, just I used it. Very cool. Uh, well, that's great to hear. I mean, we love the idea of just having people join in and build on top of it. So, uh, congratulations, and yeah, feel free to post the link uh, to the video or a demo of it. Uh, we'd love to check it out as a community. Yeah, I will surely post it. Very cool. Well, thank you so much for joining us, Vivek, and welcome to the community. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Uh, okay, let's keep going on with some more. I have a, another question, or, or a topic slash question, um, if I could throw Yeah, of course. Go, go. Um, is there a reason that we can't share screens in this chat, or in, like uh, during these water coolers? Because it seems like that could be helpful at times. Is that something maybe we could do for next year? Uh, Discord there, doesn't let you do it on stages. Ah, all right. Well, that that answers that. Okay. That... You can you can share screen in the general uh chat, voice chat channel. Like if we go to the the old school water cooler chat, um, uh, we can do it there. But on stages, uh, that that option is not available. Which all right then? I have no idea why. It doesn't really make sense. Um. But yeah, because yeah, it's bizarre. I I think the idea of having an audience and speakers is is very valuable. I like this setup quite a bit. People can just kind of sit back and listen without being called upon. Um, because I know in the in the water cooler, the old school water cooler chats for those OGs who were here at Titans like first water cooler chat, we were just like. There, there was no, there was no way to just be quiet. You had to like when you joined the chat, it was like you were in it. Um, there was no audience, you know. Um, so, but yeah, in that channel, you can share video. So, yeah. All right, no screen sharing. It is. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Unfortunately, not. Um, except for when I like go live or something, but I'm not live on this one. Um. Cool. I, I wanted to uh, talk about my topic real quick. Um, and Vivek might have a good, for anyone actually, this could be anybody. I'm uh, looking for a front end wire framing tool. Um, so LivePeer is sponsoring the Encode Hackathon. And one of their prizes is not to build something technical, but to build something beautiful. Um, and it's to build a nice, beautiful front-end wireframe for an idea of an app, right? So, uh, this uh, is something I'm interested. Check out, check out Figma. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've I've heard of Figma. I haven't really used it though. Um, is it is it is it kind of the best one to use? You think? It's like the gold standard today for it's that not, for wireframing. I don't know if it's the gold standard, but it's definitely one of the most simplified applications and it's extremely versatile. I, I haven't used it myself, but I know Adobe just bought them out. So Yeah, it's a very popular use. tool. A lot yeah, you of can web do, you can do animations on that. Um, if you've seen Graviton uh, and Xenon, they use Figma for their designing and everything. So anything you see on there, or at least most of it is built using Figma. So yeah, you know, concept you know, what... to production. You can take that UI wireframes and turn it into code too. So it's it's really powerful. Yeah, you can also I think import websites directly into Figma. So you can like bring in a, a, a pre done design and and get all the components there. Somehow I don't know exactly how it works, but there's also Illustrator. Magic. It's magic. Um, <laughs> the Adobe Stack. Any of those applications, Photoshop, Illustrator, are really good for creating those kind of things. But I think Figma is probably the easiest to get into. And it's web-based, too. That's the other yeah. one. Like Illustrator and stuff, you got to you know download the apps and run the software on your, your hardware. So just, you know, whatever, you know, fits your fancy. 
Yeah. I, well, I mean, that clearly answers my question. Cause yeah, I was like, I don't like, I've heard of Figma, but I was like, I don't know, like before I start Googling things, like I should probably just ask people, but it sounds like it's kind of the, the thing to learn. Yeah. Figma's really taken off. I, I don't know a designer who isn't using Figma. It's crazy. Yeah. Well, there you go. I've heard of it. I've heard of a tool called Balsamic, but I'm I'm not too sure of the licensing or how how good that compares to to Figma. Is it like a yeah, vinegar? Heard of like the vinegar? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, like yeah. That's great. I think it is desktop software, but um, we I've I've worked with business analysts who use that. Yeah, that was one that was real popular prior to Figma, but again, I think it's the same kind of stuff. It's like the desktop approach, the desktop software approach where Figma is more web-based. There you go. Well, I think that answers my question. I got two, I got a New Year's resolution coming up. I'm gonna learn Viper. I'm gonna learn uh, some smart, smart contract code in Viper. Probably, I don't think I'm gonna dive into Solidity, but I can do some Viper and I'll do some Figma. So there we go. Protected by Viper, stand back. Boom. Um, okay, that answers my question. I'm going to move on topics. Uh, I had another topic uh, I wanted to bring up because I thought it was curious and I wanted to know people's thoughts on this. Um, so the other day I was watching a hockey game and what I noticed was the billboard, the, uh, the, the, uh, the sideboards, um, it they were generating ads over top of the sideboards, um, and they were specific to where you were watching the video, and it was on live TV at the bar, and like is this is this more common than I think it is, like because I remember um, uh, Eric mentioned that you know. YouTubers can be holding a Pepsi can and then, you know, Coca-Cola will pay an ad and it'll convert it to a Coke can, right? Um, and you can get paid uh, micro payments in crypto for, for having these types of product placements. But you can, you can do it um, by manipulating the data. And LivePeer is that layer that you would do that, right? So I'm curious as to, like, has anyone else experienced this or noticed, like, mainstream media doing these kinds of things well it's been around for a while like if you think of like nfl games like they show like those yellow lines like the the line of scrimmage the 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 line that they, they got to get a first down on like those are all just images that were added on top of the real source image right like but again i think what you're pointing out is some of the more advanced things that people are doing nowadays where they're overlaying new images on top of existing images yeah. to virtual know, video things. coaster in a way yeah. like like a tricaster in a data center or something like that yeah like usually the tv yeah. studios do uh, yeah because I, I was just blown away because i was like as so it, it, it and depending on what camera the the game switched to it would either show so so there's one big camera at the top of the game and that camera would show the ad on the entire billboard going or, or the entire sideboard going around the entire rink. Um, and it would, it would be switching through different ads and, and there were specific, like, like, you know, I, I was watching the game was in America, but it was showing Canadian ads. And I was so confused. Cause I was like, wait, isn't this like, why would they be showing Canadian ads on a Tell billboard in America? I was like, I was like, this is crazy. Like what's going on. And then, cause and I started watching really closely and then when it would switch to the camera of um, the camera down at the goalie, it wouldn't it wouldn't be using the same technology. It was like literally just streaming raw footage of what it saw, and all the all the sideboards had like you know local ads from their local you know town or area, and you know, and I was like, whoa, like the ads. Wait, wait, wait this isn't a digital. This isn't digital. This is being this is being manipulated over top post-production kind of but it's live it's live hockey game right and yep. i was just blown away by this and I, I didn't realize that this is like actively used i didn't even notice it until now and because when when um eric talked about it he said live peer is like 
really well positioned for these type of ads because it's uh, it, you decode it, manipulate it, and then re-encode it, right? And then distribute it. That's that's where it becomes so. You know, wow, you got to pull you know four thousand k a second feed from seven different sources, encode it all, and then push it back out. It's a lot of bandwidth to do that. Yep, that's that's where I'm excited. Like, okay, yeah, actually, that that was one idea I had to 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 put for the for the hackathon, uh, an application that can do that. It's not such a complicated technology after all. OBS, video cards, virtual machine, done. A little scripty. Yeah, but he's talking about an automated way of doing yeah. it. Oh, that'd be beautiful. Oh, that that would be. A video you'd pipeline that can go from, you'd make from production every, to delivery. Yeah, yeah like every content creator. Uh, Yonder was talking about a while ago, about like overlaying graphics onto objects, and that kind of stuff. It's, it's quite like developed. That. Sorry? It, it's quite developed, that technology. It's, uh, it's already there. Yeah. Oh, they're putting it together. Yeah, what Jan and did was a proof of concept. I think they wrote some like elementary, like basic stuff that kind of demos the capabilities, but I think it hasn't been exploited yet. But couldn't you make a marketplace for these kind of ads and then have people bid on them like a like the Google ad marketplace where yep. the individual streamer is, you know, they just literally have like a blank, like blank little stand beside them playing and then based on the ad marketplace ads are being placed there and the streamers getting streamed crypto and the the you know blah 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 right it's just like the radio networks today if you if you listen to radio and stuff where they have like station id and they're they're always like intermixing local versions of the the content it's the same yep. kind of paradigm it's just with video and now you're talking about a permissionless approach to doing it right yep. where where the transactions are now governed by predetermined conditions and then the software automates it all wonder if yeah you... that's 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 what i'm looking to build but then again the challenge we run into later is when you become so big and eventually you, you can't you can't go and steal someone else's content and make money on it. That's, but then again, it's like, wow, huh, that's a tough one. I'm just a service provider. I have no idea and don't care. <laughs> you can almost like safe harbor where you you just have like a QR code over top of the area, and so then the the AI knows, hey, over top of this QR code is where I'm going to put the ad, and it knows it where to send the payments to because of the QR code. And so you, 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 you can't, can't, you can't st if you were to steal the content and show that QR code ad, it, the ad is still generating money to the end, to the person who created the content rather than. There like, you go. There you go. That's the way to do it. That's a I still feel idea. like it's a broadcaster. It's got to be similar to the radio where it's like there's, there's syndication networks where like, for example, you know, Rush Limbaugh, you know, I don't know, he's dead now, but again, he had where he would put his content and then he would strike agreements with these syndication networks where they could say, I'm a broadcaster in the Kansas area and I'll, uh, I'll take that content and then they can inject at strategic points of the content, like certain time points where they can say, okay, from this slot to this slot is where you can insert your, your ad, right? And then you would say, okay, here's the ad format. Here's the stuff. You give them the, the content to insert, and then the, the software will automate it all. But you could do that through webs and portals and, and things now, whereas it, it would typically have been done through, you know, phone calls or what have you and predefined setups and, you know, a lot of manual effort to make that kind of stuff happen. Whereas today with Web3 and this stuff could be streamlined significantly. But again, though, it's the, that's those are grand visions, right? Uh, yes, the grand visions. I love it. All right. Well, anyway, th those were my topics. Turns out, go look at Figma, and um, yeah, this technology is already already there, and so we, you know, live here can just implement it somehow. Uh, I wonder if like the content recognition component would be a key starting point. 
with that, you know, just being able to recognize where to place that on the screen. I, I saw like that demo with the soccer ball or, or whatever, and they could track the soccer ball on the screen. Um, so that would be, I think it would be kind of built on top of that. I think Nujar just pointed out that he has a grant for that kind of stuff. He's doing research now as one of his milestones. No, it's, it's not the same. Um, I, I wanted to do an application like that for the for the hackathon, but the grant is for 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 actual tamper for for detection of the um, of the copyright. Uh, well, oh, uh, right, right. Yeah, your see. hackathon is where you did scene detection, but the the grant is for filled copyright copywritten material detection. I mean, it's actually the, the application of the MPEG-7 signature that comes with every video that has some, this is, is a lot of signals there. And then you can use them to, to, to match uh, video. It's is quite... that like DRM, like digital rights management stuff in audio? Is that similar? It's one of the applications, yeah. But, but you can also use it for, for example, for, for retrieving. If, if you have a topic, a uh, specific uh, topic associated with the signature, then other videos that are already similar, they can also be grouped within the same video, which is already tagged, for example. And then you can have uh, groups of videos. Uh, or oh. yeah. so if you want to take out all the videos about Obama, then they have a, they have a specific signature behind them. I see. So do you have to like, do you buy those signatures or like, are they publicly available where you can just get them? You, you compute them with a FMPEG. Oh, if it, if so you teach it. Right here. I see. You learn that you create the signature. Yeah, yeah you can do that. Uh, like Spear is doing that at the moment. You need to enable it in the, in the transcoder. And then it really the, the signature. Yeah, it's, it was, it's for a year. Right what? I gotta go check that out. I don't think I've ever seen any of that. In the current go live here, there's something in a transcoder where it can save scene detection signatures. It can save uh, just the signature, just the signature. So, oh. um, yeah, it's, it's a binary. Or I don't know if it's binary or in uh, XML. It's a. It. I, I will. I mean, it's it's already mentioned in the Yondon Yondon Fu. He he opened that about a year ago about the, the usage of this uh, MPEG-7 signature. Oh. And this is quite cool. I mean, you, need to, you need to decode it and then do some things with it. But, but that's a different topic from, from actual uh, computer vision and app placement. And, and the biggest problem with the app placement is, is what Titan Noel was mentioning before to create this marketplace. That's the most complicated. The technology for, for putting ads in the background is, is there for, for a long time. Yeah. yeah. I was just it thinking you might, you might be able to do it with like a green screen thing. It might not even require such advanced uh, content detection. It could be like a, in the video, there's like a green screen area and it just replaces that, that certain color uh, with the ad or something. It's so advanced that you don't even need that anymore. You don't need chromas anymore. You can just wow. just, just train a model and, and whatever is the background, and then they detect backgrounds and foregrounds. And, but but the marketplace where where you make a, an economics around it, when you actually get paid for that, that's that's the that's the big deal. Yeah, this is the tough part. That's what I thought mm -hmm. of, like the QR codes. If you if you put that directly in the video, then. You know, manipulating that video, you it, it'll see the QR code, so therefore it, it knows it's authentic, and it'll just pay you directly. Where where would you put the QR code in the in the background? Or, or yeah, like like background. where you want to display your ad, you put the QR code on it. I don't know. I I haven't thought this through. I just just talking <laughs> verification that it aired basically. Yeah. No, that... It, it, this is this is just an idea. This is not a good idea. I just, I mean, it's a good idea, but it's, I haven't even thought about how this would work. So, um, 
Well, here, here's a use case that I thought about that, I, again, I, I was looking at at one point was we, we were talking about, like, how do we as orchestrators know that a transcoder can do a certain amount of capabilities, right? Like we were talking about reliability and performance. And one of the things that I looked at was, like, you would want to send a stream through the system in which every step in the video processing pipeline when it would alter the video, it would add like a timestamp on the video. So like somebody at the end, like say for example, you sent a test stream into the org and he had zero work going and you would have a timestamp on the, on the image or the video you sent first. And then at the very end, the transcoder would, transcode would put a timestamp on it that said it transcoded how long it took. And then at the very end of the video pipeline, you could look at all the timestamps and say, oh, okay, you know, storage to disk took this amount of time, transcoding took this amount of time, and you would just alter the video through the pipeline. And at the very end, the, you would have all of this like internal metrics about how long every step of the process took. And you would just look at the video and then like parse out those different parts. And then you could store that and use that as part of like, a metrics collection system of some sort. And that was one of the things that I thought about. And there's actually like GStreamer and some of these streaming technologies out there today that have pipelines that kind of do this instrumentation for you, which is really cool. But again, I, it's kind of off topic, but it's a use case that I feel like that's all fits together, right? I just had a thought to come to my head. I want to dive back around to the reliability and performance dashboard. We should also create a tool that we can do stress tests on our orchestrators. It would be really nice to have a tool that, you know, you just spin up and it just sends, you know, 20, 50, 100, 200 streams to an orc node and checks to see like how good it does or how, if it fails, you know, like uh, real time. I wonder if you can implement yeah, that. Yeah, what are the somehow. upward? Yeah, what are the upward capabilities? Like, what? When, when does your orc fall over? Like, what's its max capability? Yeah, like theoretically, keep cranking it up until it falls apart. Yeah, theoretically. Now you would do it in a stage environment, right? You're not going to take down your real orc or anything, but you, if you really want to benchmark it, that's you'd do that. Dude, I'd, I'd do it, man. Net. Let's try it out. Let's break. Oh, my, let's that's break how it. we roll, baby. Yeah, that's how we roll. Main net number net. one, buddy. Let's do it. I, I think <laughs> yeah, the price per broadcaster setting, you know, would allow you to, to whitelist that. And then, you know, I think something like that would be nice if there was some kind of web three authentication, like, like, let's say if you're going to do it, uh, you might want to have somebody authenticate that they are, um, you know, they own that address uh, that they're trying to orchestrate, te you know, test as far as orchestrator. Um, although, I mean, technically anyone could send a, a bunch of streams anywhere, um, you know, for something that easy, it might be a good idea to have some kind of authentication for it. But that would also be like a good unicycle, so to speak, for the uh, reliability testing back end. Yeah, like I'm, I'm wondering, like, you know, like I'll, I'll just like whitelist my live peer academy broadcaster node and then just... I just, and I know how to stream like one through it through like OBS, but like, how do I stream like a hundred through it? Like I, I would, I yeah. would build, have to build some sort of tool. I don't know how to automate, like, is there like a Python script or something that I could build to like stream that through? Like, just Well, remember, you're, it's not going to be like a tool and software to stream, right? Because you have physical limits that you're going to be faced with. Like a single node running in a single data center can only let you know generate how many streams before its bandwidth chokes off so you're going to need a like a a targeted a strike where you know three or four areas with different data centers can can hammer it to a point where your node will fall over but the testing tool won't fall over because you'll the testing tool will fall over before your node probably or you know you won't be able to get enough from a single node so it, it can't be done with a piece of software it has to be you know, instrument across multiple nodes. There's a tool called uh, JMeter um, that that used to do that kind of stuff for me back in the day. I don't, I don't know if it's still popular or not, but I think if you do JMeter and you can you can uh, set up a stress test, 
you can set up multiple nodes and then have one like controller node say send x amount of streams to new york x amount of streams to uh pennsylvania and x amount to new jersey and let it all just like hammer your your new york node or something like i'm pretty sure you can you can automate that but it's not going to be like writing a python script or anything Well, there you go. I I used to do e-commerce sites, you know, NFL shop, a whole bunch of different kind of sites, and those kinds of stress testing tools were critical when you try to like replicate Super Bowl, you know, Super Bowl activity. You know, you're gonna have a lot more people from all kinds of places around the world hitting you all at once. Versus, I mean, again, I think Andrew can speak to this. He's talking about running a, a CDN, so he's yep. probably very familiar with with these kinds of global uh, scaling challenges. Yeah. You got to do it right to the backbone. So one of the reasons, not just this project, but just being an ISP is we're like right to level three, right to the backbone. I mean, there's no last mile. We are the last mile. So it's really, really important to have those super fast, low latency, high speed connectivity to move that data from point A to point B to point C to anywhere in the world. But I think where it really matters with, to tie it to Titan's thing is that like, he's saying is if they can do a load test type tool for yep. this reliability board, they're going to yep. need infrastructure to, to deploy and run it. So yep. maybe this is where your ISP Absolutely. Uh, might help, uh, help aid okay. in that. Absolutely. I mean, load testing, stress testing. I mean, we have it quite quote unquote launched as an ISP out of this particular office building. So it's a perfect opportunity to understand what we can and cannot handle. When the, when the techs came by and installed the fiber, we're doing nine K jumbo frames. I'm like, Wow. Okay. So I'm like super, super online. Like there's online, then there's online, online. Wow. <laughs> I've yet to try it. I'm still waiting to figure out how to turn the damn thing on. We have light coming down the pipe, but we have no link. It's like, cool. Well, I'll go ahead and sit here with my thumb up my ass for another uh, day or two until you figure <laughs> it out. <laughs> what am I going to do? Right. And it's taken us three and a half years to get to this point. So, you know, hurry up and wait. Second, just turn and on. And build <laughs> Rome in a day. No, that's right. You didn't build Roman a day either. <laughs> you know, my like my business partner says, um, start an ISP, said no one. Uh, it would be easy. Again, said no one. Oh, they're right. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So it's like, okay, here's your thousands and thousands of dollars. Now give me my internet. Oh, we may have to wait. Oh, whatever. Okay, hurry up and wait. So I'm I just I really believe that this this Web three is our future. You know, having used internet since its inception, you know, the early '90s to now, I, I see it's like wow. Um, yeah, Big Brother, um, ISPs, you know, net neutrality. Eventually, the government's already the U.S. government's already said they don't care about you know for whatever. Let the ISPs decide. N no, well, yes, but no. H how do we let the ISPs decide? But you're not blocking my port, so I'll, I'll do all my traffic over 443, so you're not blocking SSL. Uh, well, that's 95% of the internet, so good luck. Yeah, I'm a big fan of what this project and many more like it do. Yeah, I think it's fascinating what you're working on, Andrew, and I uh, really support what your, your goals of your project are. And we you really to. need you know operators with that kind of yeah. infrastructure. It's very yep. useful for all kinds of, of, of things that we could do. <laughs> There we go. Uh, cool. Uh, John, do you want to quickly give us an up update about the NetIn cards and what you've been doing there and, and what have you been yeah. seeing? Yeah, so, um, you know, this goes all the way back to June uh, when we first looked into using NetInt and I acquired two T408 uh, transcoders from NetInt. And, um, you know, I benchmarked those on Windows and they weren't really the best. And you know, back then didn't really have all the test framework and knowledge of development that they could do today with LivePeer. Um, so I've been working with Ivan and uh, two things. So one was the, we'd upgraded the firmware on the T408s um, to like the latest, like 3.1.0 that came out in September. Um, and NetInt had, had committed to, back in July, to deliver a more performant firmware. Um, so we were really looking forward to that. And when I tried to go back through the process and recompile it, uh, we were getting these runtime errors. Um, so I reached out to Ivan and um, he helped kind of not just, you know, get us to the point of identifying where the issues were, but also really build a repeatable process uh, with uh, like the install FFmpeg SH script so that 
I mean, there's a couple pieces and we're going to write this whole process down. Um, but so that somebody can essentially, you know, get their, their, their live peer compiled with the FFmpeg dependencies and run their NetInt equipment um, on live peer. And so, I mean, the requirements, um, you know, we're still kind of researching. It's sort of like a research and development effort right now. Uh, but where we are at is uh, we've got, we've been able to use that price per broadcaster feature to run the test stream through and watch the video. Um, actually, the video is not coming out. We've got audio and no video right now. Uh, the video segments are missing some headers, um, but we were able to do some benchmark tests and, you know, we're running like around 700 milliseconds for something that probably should be doing one or 200 milliseconds on an NVIDIA. Um, so, and, and then we see a lot of like really high IO CPU weights on, on the machine. So, uh, as you know, NetInt is really uh, intensive on the CPU. Um, it's sort of like a coprocessor, really. You're kind of like encoding with CPU. So the next steps for the effort are to, you know, obviously fix the part where we're not able to see the video, um, and then also um, work on CPU scaling. You know, there may be some settings when we compile FFmpeg. Uh, I think there's even ways you can control the quality that you're putting out uh, through that. But um, there's there's supposedly some scaling options that are optimized for NVIDIA that are kind of in the script today that we can convert to more CPU focus scaling. So there may be some performance improvements there. Um, uh, but, you know, over the past uh, couple of days, I've um, been busy on other things and Ivan has to. Uh, but, you know, I feel like I'm at a point where I don't need as much of his help and I can move forward with doing some more of that troubleshooting. But we've been just working, we worked around the clock for about a week there, just iterating, you know, he would do some development, I would do some testing and uh, it's come hey, pretty John. far. Yeah. John, do you mind if I ask a question? Yeah. How uh, is the need to recompile FFmpeg? Is that because the NetInt and NVIDIA drivers are, or the support for it are statically linked in, or are they dynamically linked in? And, or is it related to card specific settings of FFmpeg that have to be recompiled? It's, 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 it's yeah, you're exactly right. Um, the, the libraries have to be linked in. Um, I, I believe it is a dynamic link to a shared library. So what you have is okay. you actually have to have an FFmpeg and they call libx coder installed in the runtime environment and set up in a certain directory. Um, and there's like an environment variable for that that points uh, FFmpeg PKG to it. config. Exactly. PKG package config. Yeah. Yeah. And then FFmpeg itself has to be compiled with a, a whole bunch of other options. Um, that that target that actually enable the libx coder framework, which libx coder is basically NetInt's um, driver, if you will. It's it's the way it interfaces uh, with it. Another particular thing is is the the libx coder isn't really free software, so they, we can't really distribute it. And and from what oh, I've seen, like, if you think of like building a live peer binary, I don't know that we're going to be at a point where we can just build a live peer binary and make that available for NetInt. Um, but it, we want to try to. We need to make the process as easy as possible for somebody if they have the the libx coder code to just you know get up and going pretty easily. Uh, yeah, the way, dynamic linking is critical for that. If you're going to do that, if you can't distribute those binaries, they got to be on the system. Dynamic linking is the only way. Yeah, and so having a build script and a defined process that makes it do repeatable is kind of important. Um, yeah, so that's that's really you know, where we're at right now. And uh, it's been fun and exciting overall. I mean, I'd, I'd love to go get an Epic, AMD Epic 702 processor and, and you know, build like a $5,000 server and just see what it can do. Um, I've talked, I've thought about maybe reaching out to NetInt now that we have some actual build that we can benchmark and seeing how that really performs in their environment. Uh, you know, it'd be a lot of money to spend if it's only gonna give you a little benefit. So um, what are you looking at timeline wise though? How how much effort do you have remaining before this stuff becomes like available for folks to use and play around with? Um, you know, considering that right now it's kind of the holidays and stuff, um, I don't know that we'll solve it this week or, you know, in the remainder of the month. We we may get some traction here. I think it's really low effort at this point though. Uh, the the issues that we have like, so there's those two main things. One is the the video missing some headers in the segments. 
and there's going to be also some optimi optimizations for performance to be made. So we'll have to do a little more iteration on testing. Um, I don't know, maybe hours is uh, less than 20 hours or something like that. Yeah, I was going to say, no, I'm not pressuring you or anything. I'm just curious, but I get it, holidays and stuff. So you're probably first quarter next year, you guys are looking to finish up. <laughs> Yeah, I think so. And, and you know, it required changes to LPMS, too. One thing that really tripped us up was uh, they had upgraded the LibX coder library to have it. They just, like, renamed the uh, the codec, like, you know, an include file in C. They added underscore Logan to the end of all of them for the T408 series, T, T4X wow. series. And that's, this is to actually, the whole, the whole release supports Quadra. And so if you want to use Quadra, it's underscore Quadra. Um, so that piece of it kind of isn't really fully solved for on the LPMS side because we just can you know set up another, another branch with underscore Logan at the end. Um, but yeah, it's just a lot of moving parts there. Um, but it's exciting to see if it really works. Um, I mean, you know, for for a node like ours that we've mostly just got one primary node, I mean, performance and speed is the most is really important to be able to reach people across the world. Um, so if this doesn't perform really well. Uh, in that regard, we might be looking at using it more for like localized deployments. Like if we could create a really low power transcoding server, we could, you know, maybe co-locate that for cheaper. Um, cool. You know, in a different region or something, but uh, it'd be really cool to have a super fast elite encoder that just does the whole world in one location, but um, we just got to keep testing. So isn't LibX, um, a, a, that's a software encoder, right? Yeah. For yeah. Yep. So, so uh, maybe I'm not understanding. So, uh, the version. So, you, um, did you say that the, uh, sorry, that yeah. the, uh, uh, blanket on the name, uh, the dead end card uses, um, LibX as it's, um, yeah. I, I got a little, t I got, I guess I missed part of how that all ties together. Yeah, so when it, uh, so if you buy it net and hardware, they'll you know send you like a quick start guide and a link to their latest firmware release and software release. And the the software release they're really referring to the LibX coder. Um, and then and then there's different versions of that. So when they went to version, because like early back in June we were working with two point eight, I think, and now we're on when they released three point zero in September, they totally changed the naming of the libraries the way you reference them in the actual code so some of the work that had been done on netit before had to be revisited to support uh, the latest firmware which adds support for quadra i think what at the end of the day the, the the value i guess you're getting out of the card is that it's going to delegate more software so that the cpu is involved more right yeah, I mean, if you had a really fast CPU with a lot of cores, I mean, I I can't see why this this would be much would be a very slow like I don't see why it would still be going at seven hundred milliseconds. Um, Do you think it, it would outperform Nvidia in that scenario? Possibly. So, wow. Um, I I mean, I don't know. I want to find out. <laughs> it's a it's a it's a time consuming, expensive endeavor, but uh, it's very. Interesting. Now, I mean, it seems like NetInt is great for capacity and scale, too. I mean, you could apparently run a lot of streams. Maybe they're not the fastest. I'm trying to see where the value add is here, because at first we were thinking, well, if we can only do six streams, well, we can do them super fast. And that's worth the hardware. You know, right. Well, um, I was gonna say, if you look at the if you look at the latency measurements from live peer, if you can get like Every the fastest ones we're seeing are what the 1070s, right? 1080s. I guess those are the cards that give us the, the lowest scores there. Consistent. Like if you can get that even lower, that's that's a competitive advantage there, man. Yeah, and, and you know, some of the video on demand stuff that's going on too. I mean, we, I think we saw, you know, during that time, at least I I saw these spikes come in, but it would almost seem like some of that load would almost affect your regular streaming. Um, so something like NetInt, I'm, I understand, is supposed to be able to handle those spikes and load a little bit better, and that that could have an advantage as well. And they're they're advertising the, for like metaverse and stuff. Sorry, is the is the quality the same? It's supposed to be the same, like card to card. You know, on Nvidia, based on generation, you might have quality differences. 
Um, is it something like that the case with net ink cards too, or is it supposed to be the same? Generally? I've heard that it's better quality. Um, that's one thing I've heard about. And then of course that, you know, AV one supports got more work to be done, I think broader, but, um, yeah, I mean, I've, I've been told that even the quadras look better than the T four X series. And in general, I think the T four Oh eight is better than the, uh, NVIDIA, but I, like I said, we weren't able to get it uh, to see the video as it was, uh, transcoding. So, um, I, I can run FFmpeg and actually just encode something that way um i haven't tested that yet to see if if that part is actually working that's part of our our troubleshooting we have to do so i'd uh, be interested to see what the real results with that are but they're supposed to be better quality yeah no rush for me either though man enjoy the holidays <laughs> thanks yeah and and then you know we did see that little uh bug with the live pure cli so definitely look forward to pushing that soon That'll yeah be that's quick be fix. Too bad. Yeah. Very cool. Uh, any other topics before we uh, sign off? Does anyone have any questions, comments, or concerns that they might have for the last nine minutes of this conversation? I think we covered quite a few things. We covered, um, you know, where has all the work gone? And uh, I think we've come to a conclusion on where that is. Um, hopefully, um, you know, we'll see uptick of work into the new year, which will be great. Um, we pretty much are at the bear. We are super bearish among all markets, so that might be affecting it as well. Um, but yeah, uh, also, I will maybe revitalize the, the uh, performance and reliability dashboard thread and... Um, Get some interest in continuing on with that uh, project and uh, yeah so without that uh, or without further ado no what was i going to say uh, any last comments cool uh, I, I, i'll just add uh, i'd love to help contribute to that reliability dashboard as well keep working on that as we have time yeah definitely it's been on the back burner for no good reason other than procrastination so um yeah we will um uh, we'll we'll fire that back up um otherwise uh next week we will not be having a water cooler chat this is the first water cooler chat of the year that we will be skipping intentionally um or skipping at all i think we've hit every week this year which is uh pretty amazing um so yeah next week is gonna be boxing day and i figured you know what um there's just no reason to be uh doing a water cooler chat on Boxing Day. I think Boxing Day is pretty much a, a family-oriented or, or holiday-oriented day. So we are going to skip that day. And the next day is going to be January 2nd uh, for a water cooler. So, uh, yeah, it'll be two weeks till our next water cooler. Um, I've got a couple of people lined up for January that want to do Q&A sessions. Um, so hopefully we can get that all lined up. And uh, yeah, so we'll end it there. Thank you everyone for coming. Uh, Merry Christmas, happy holidays, uh, wherever you are on the planet. And we will see you all in two weeks. Cheers. Thanks, guys. Thanks, all. Thanks, Joe. Yeah, see you later.